the GI surveillance module and the BSI module and the UTI module. What we will be discussing today is two very different modules. One is the VAC module. Um, just to give a heads up, you many of you might be knowing that um, CDC has uh, stopped surveillance for ventilator associate, associated pneumonia because of problems with definitions, although they have been uh, doing VAP surveillance for almost 20 years before it was, you know, decided that um, the, the diagnosis of VAP starts with uh, imaging, you know, and that is where the problem lies that uh, there is a lot of discrepancy in imaging and the interpretation and also that there are different definitions now being used, which are known as ventilator associated complications which can be events and probable VAP and IVAP. So, uh, because we talk about India-specific definitions, when we talk about device-associated infections or hospital-acquired infections, we had this discussion with ICMR that ventilator-associated pneumonia is something that we cannot ignore because Ultimately, VAP is one of the most common causes of morbidity and mortality in India and elsewhere also in ICUs. And uh, the IVAC and PVAP and ventilator associated event is something which at a network level is very difficult to do because as it is, you would have seen that surveillance for BSI and UTI itself is very, very labor intensive. It requires a very dedicated staff. It requires perseverance and continuous and sustained efforts at local institutional levels. To do the same for ventilator associated events uh, would be even more difficult. So two years back, we actually took uh, some of the definitions for VAP, uh, obviously taken from the original CDC's NHSN definitions, but modified according to what some of the hospitals in India are doing, because ultimately most hospitals uh, who are doing surveillance are also doing surveillance for VAP based on some definitions. So again, as for BSI and UTI, where we had sat down together and made a country specific protocol, uh, we at AIMS along with ICMR and a couple of hospitals in India made a definition for VAP, which is adapted from the original CDC's NHSN definition, but modified according to what couple of Indian hospitals are doing. So this will be a short session because most of the definitions you would be knowing, I'll just, um, what you have to really focus on is that we have made a modified version and as for the BSI and UTI, we have put more emphasis on microbiology. You would see that the VAB definition, uh, which is there currently in the CDC's NHSN puts microbiological diagnosis or detection as an optional um, category. But herein, because we have the micro capacity, we are leveraging the ICMR and NCDC's microbiology capacity. We have modified the definition to keep microbiology culture as um, one of the essential criteria. Uh, following this session will be a session on surgical site infection by Dr. Daniel van der Ende from CDC. And that will also talk about a modified definition for surveillance for uh, surgical site infection, and he will elaborate on why we have modified. So most of the modifications have been done so that surveillance becomes uh, easier, country specific, and something which is doable, even at district hospital levels, if you want to do that. So again, uh, surgical site infection is something which is often ignored. It is difficult because it requires long-term follow-up of patients, and that is why, again, we came out with uh, a definition and a particular surgery that is cesarean section, which is very important from maternal and child health perspectives, the priority of government of India, and also because it's a priority for all of us. So I'll just take uh, maybe a half an hour for the surveillance for VAP, and then I'll hand over to Dr. Daniel for his session on surgical site infection. So the objectives of this session will be uh, you will be able to describe key terms and case definitions which are used in VAP surveillance. So uh, just to give a heads up, uh, almost 11 hospitals in our network are already working on this VAP surveillance. So it's also a kind of validation of what, whether this VAP surveillance definition that we have made is doable and 
uh, I understand that at some of the district hospitals, uh, ventilators are not available. So this can be an optional thing. It's not necessary that uh, those hospitals who do not have ventilators in the ICUs, uh, obviously this uh, protocol will not be applicable to them. So you'll be dis able to describe key terms and case definition, complete the VAP infection and denominator reporting form, conduct basic analysis of VAP surveillance data and correctly apply case definitions to identify VAP cases. So coming to the case definitions and the protocol. Now, what is a ventilator? For this surveillance, ventilator is defined as any device which is used to support, assist or control respiration. This is inclusive of the weaning period through the application of positive pressure to the airway when delivered via an artificial airway, especially an oral or nasal endotracheal or tracheostomy tube. Please note that ventilation and lung expansion devices that deliver positive pressure to the airway, for example, CPAP, BiPAP, bilevel, IPPB, and PEEP via non-invasive means like nasal prongs, nasal mask, full face mask, and total mask are not considered ventilators unless positive pressure is delivered via an artificial airway, which is, as I have said, an oral or nasal endotracheal or tracheostomy tube. So for VAP surveillance, as I mentioned, this VAP surveillance, which we are proposing to the network is focusing on laboratory confirmed VAP. So it is microbiology driven. So all the uh, facilities who are participating in this surveillance must have labs that are able to perform respiratory sample cultures and blood cultures. The hospital microbiology laboratories should be able to identify pathogens to the species level as is true, as was true for DSI and UTI. So coming to the first key term, we talked about window period yesterday in all the three modules. What is the window period? It is at seven day time frame in which all the criteria of the case definition must be met. It includes the date of the first positive case defining criteria and the three calendar days before and three after. So what is different from the BSI and UTI module is that for VAP surveillance, we are building a window period around the first positive case defining criteria, not necessarily against the first positive diagnostic test. So any positive case defining criteria and the three calendar days before and after is how we build up the window period for the ventilator associated pneumonia surveillance. So a seven day time frame in which all criteria of the case definition must be met. It includes the date of the first positive case defining criteria and the three calendar days before and three calendar days after. So how do you set up the window period? So consider this example. The microbiology lab falls you on 19th June to report that a bronchoalveolar lavage culture collected from a patient in the ICU on 17th June is growing Klebsiella pneumoniae. What is the window period of this potential VAP? You can put it in the chat box and I have taken a simpler example where I have taken a diagnostic test uh, as uh, a marker for setting a window period considering that we are taking microbiology as one of the defining criteria. So uh, 14 to 20. So here, correct. So the microbiology labs calls you on 19 June to report that a bile culture collected from a patient in the ICU on 17th is, collect, is growing Klebsiella pneumonia. And we assume that it's 10 to the power 5 because that's the cutoff that we usually when you take. So uh, the window period will be three days before 17 and three days after 17. So it will be as all of you are saying, it is from 14th to 20th June. Now considering what is the so, so window period, just to reiterate, why do we set up a window period? Because through window period, we come to know what is the date of event, which is the first date when we supposedly say that the event started because it is the date 
example, the first element used to meet the VAP case definition occurs for the first time within the window period. So, okay, just to recapitulate, we have a collection of uh, criteria to define a case as BSI, UTI, VAP. So, all these case defining elements must occur during the window period. And whatever happens first is used as the date of event. That means it is the date when the event started. So the date of event is the date when the first element used to meet the VAP case definition occurs for the first time within the window period. So now your surveillance staff goes to the ICU and you review the chart of the patient with Klebsiella pneumoniae from this example. And you find that the patient had a chest X-ray with progressive infiltrates on 18th June. The patient develops a fever on 16th June. So now the patient meets the VAP case definition. Okay, I will come to the case definition, but the patient had an X-ray, bad X-ray, progressive infiltrates on 18th June and fever which developed on 16th June. Okay. So now what is the date of event for this probable VAP? 16. Okay. So most of you are saying it is 16. Okay. So in this patient, you had a positive microbiology sample, which was collected on 17 June, a progressive infiltrate, which was detected on 18 June and a fever on 16 June. So, of all the criteria which are required to coin a case as ventilator-associated pneumonia, the first thing that happened during the window period was on 16th June and that is why 16th June becomes the date of event. Supposing this patient also had fever on 15th June and 14th June, your date of event would have been 14th June because the first element which occurs for the first time in the window period. So, fever is the first element. If it was the patient was febrile from 14 June, during the window period, whatever happens first, first element which happens for the first time within the window period. So, that is how you determine the date of event. And as discussed yesterday, you need the date of event because you also need to set the event time frame. That when did this event start and when did that event end? Okay. So, once you have set the date of event, the next thing is whether that event is hospital acquired or it is present in admission. So, for hospital acquired infection, this date of event, which you said was 14th, 14 June, this date of event must be more than two calendar days after the date of hospital admission. Present in admission is when the date of event is less than or equal to two calendar days, which was discussed yesterday also. So, we have set the date of event. So, the next logical term that we come to is the event time frame. The surveillance protocol includes a rule to separate primary HEI events for the same patient because as I discussed yesterday, a patient may have multiple VAPs during the course of the stay. And therefore, we need to know when one event is ending, when you need to finish your case report form, document the outcomes and submit it to the database. That is by knowing when did the event start and what is the event time frame. So, the event time frame is a 14-day time frame during which a primary VAP is considered to be ongoing and no new VAPs can be reported for the patient. So, the date of event is the first day. And if you do or identify organisms from respiratory sample during this event time frame, it is to be added to the case report form for the initial VAP. So this is an example of a VAP with the date of event as 25th September. So supposing it was a ventilator associated pneumonia due to Klebsiella pneumonia with the date of event as 25th September. So as we know, the event is ongoing for 14 days. So, this event will continue from 25th September to 8th October. No new episode of VAP is to be reported during this period. So, now suppose you have a respiratory sample like a tracheal aspirate, which grows acinetobacter bomini 10 to the power 5 on 30th September. 
this is not to be reported as a new VAP. This organism should be reported in the same case report form as a new organism. So it is one episode with multiple pathogens. So what are the inclusion criteria? Recall that the inclusion criteria have been developed to confirm that a VAP is healthcare associated and it is attributable to the ICU. So obviously, VAP will occur in the ICU because ventilated patients are in the ICU. So you have to report all the following into the database when the date of event does not occur within an ongoing event and the date of event must be more than two calendar days from ICU admission. So if all the criteria are fulfilled, you should report that. Otherwise, you need not report that case. So a case report form is completed for all VAPs that meet the inclusion criteria. This is not only for VAP, but for also BSIs and UTI. That everything that fits into your definition must be reported on a monthly basis. So what is ventilator associated pneumonia? It is a pneumonia where the patient is on mechanical ventilation for more than two calendar days on the date of event with the date of ventilator placement being day one and or the ventilator was in place on the date of event or the day before. So as for BSI and UTI, we have seen that um, you know, these devices are the risk factors for causing device associated infections. So whether it is a central line or a catheter or a ventilator, we assume that more than two calendar days of placement of a device is a risk factor for device associated infection. So to call it as VAP, the ventilator must be there for more than two calendar days on the date of event or it was removed just prior to the date of event or on the date, uh, date of event. So first thing is that it should be more than two calendar days, but it may have been removed on the day or a day before. And for reporting multiple episodes of VAP, the event time frame guidance from BSI UTI module needs to be followed. So as I said, the event time frame is for 14 days, so no new VAPs are to be reported if there is already an ongoing ventilator associated pneumonia. So now coming to the definition that we are using in this surveillance network for VAP, and this is the diagnostic algorithm. So there are three categories, three criteria. The first is one or more serial chest imaging test results with at least one of the following. Please pay attention to that. So you have a chest imaging X-ray with at least one of the following, a new and persistent or progressive and persistent infiltrate consolidation or cavitation. Now this is where you will really need your ICNs to focus upon because as microbiologists or as nurses, we, all, we find that we are not competent enough to read an X-ray, which is uh, especially in certain cases where, you know, consolidation and cavitation and emphysema and lung collapse may be very confusing. And that is where the problem lies in VAP that you really need um, uh, a very good rapport with either the radiologist or the intensivist to ascertain and to interpret a chest X-ray. And that is where the effort lies. All the others are very easy. They are objective parameters. But it is the chest X-ray, which is more subjective, and that is where you really need to discuss with your intensivist or radiologist. So the X-ray has to show a new and persistent or progressive and persistent infiltrate or consolidation or cavitation, any one of them, and of course, within the window period. So that is criteria one. The second is signs and symptoms. So among the signs and symptoms, the first one is a, sign, a symptom like any one of the following, either a fever, leukopenia or leukocytosis, and for adults more than 70 years old, altered mental status with no other recognized cause. So you have a chest X-ray, one of the findings, 
you have one of the following signs and symptoms from B.1. It is either fever or leukopenia or leukocytosis and for elderly is altered mental status. And one of the following, which is uh, an indication of an altered respiratory parameter or an altered characteristic in production of sputum. So any one of the following, which is new onset of purulent sputum, change in the character of sputum, increased respiratory secretions, increased requirement of suctioning, new onset or worsening cough, dyspnea, tachypnea, rails or long term breath sounds or worsening gas exchange. So if you see the criteria that we have used, one is an X-ray finding, one is a clinical symptom and one is a parameter which suggests that there is worsening of gas exchanges or a change in the character of um, coughing or sputum. Okay, so one of the following uh, is to be fulfilled. And the final is the laboratory findings. Because as I said that we are leveraging the capacity of microbiology laboratory and that is why we have put a microbiology criteria as essential criteria. So at least one of the following, which is a positive quantitative or semi-quantitative culture from either bowel, endotracheal, aspirate or sputum. So we have put in a wide uh, range of either ors if you see the criteria. So either one of a positive quantitative or semi-quantitative culture or you have organisms identified from pleural fluid because you would agree that pleural fluid is absolutely sterile fluid. Any organism identified from it is to be taken as significant. Or if you are doing microscopy, if more than 5% of bile obtained cells contain intracellular bacteria, which is often difficult and often not used as a criteria because of the expertise needed in direct microscopy. Or you have a definitive diagnosis of fungal infection through histopathology or cultures. A definitive diagnosis of Bordetella, Legionella, Mycoplasma, Chlamydia or Viral Pneumonia through either molecular or serological tests. So you may have these criteria also, which is more applicable to have hospital acquired pneumonia rather than VAP. So um, it is often that we ignore this criteria because ventilator associated pneumonias are generally caused by the normal nosocomial pathogens like gram negatives. And for immunocompromised patients, isolation of the mat matching candida species from blood and sputum, endotracheal aspirate and bowel will also be taken as positive. So one of you asked about isolation of candida from blood and urine and, for, and from sputum. So I had clarified yesterday about the importance of blood, uh, candida from blood. Of course, you have to take that. For our surveillance, we are also taking candida from urine because that's one exception that we have made in our UTI surveillance case definition. But for VAP, it is only for immunocompromised patients where if you isolate a matching candida from blood and sputum or respiratory sample, it will also be taken as a positive uh, diagnostic criteria. If you isolate coagulase, then it is staph or enterococcus species or candida species uh, from otherwise immunocompetent patients. You have to ignore that. So the only exception is candida species from immunocompromised patients. Otherwise, coagulase negative staph and enterococcus have to be ignored. So for diagnosis of VAP, you should either have an X-ray finding plus one of the signs of symptoms, which is fever, leukocytosis, leukopenia. One of the signs of symptoms of worsening respiratory uh, parameters and a microbiology definition, uh, microbiology confirmation. So it is A plus B1 plus B2 plus C. If all these four occur within the window period, it is called as ventilator associated pneumonia and whatever happens first is taken as the date of event. Is that clear? Okay. So how do you find the case? As for other uh, device associated infections, we have to work with the microbiology lab, check the respiratory registers and the blood logbooks because 
blood is important in VAP also because a lot uh, many times there is secondary bacteremia and a matching culture is always helpful. Work with ICU staff because you need to talk to clinicians for the x-rays and that is one thing where you need extra effort and you have to query a variety of data sources like medical records, lab records and conversation with clinical staff. So about data entry, as for BSI and UTI, you will be filling a case report form for each identified case of VAP. And the denominator data here is the ventilator days and patient days. Okay, so you can have one denominator form which has four columns. Uh, one is the patient days, the other can be center line days, police catheter days and ventilator days. So what are the denominators that we use for calculation of VAM? We use the ventilator days and patient days. The denominator data should be collected at the same time every day for each participating ICU, including weekends and holidays. The denominator forms for collection of patient days and ventilator days, they are enclosed in the SOP, which will be provided to you. So what is a ventilator day? The denominator data is calculated, the ventilator day is calculated as the number of patients who are on ventilator in each ICU under surveillance each day. So when your surveillance staff goes to the ICU, you just have to see that how many patients are on bed and how many are on ventilator days. You just have to write the numbers and at the end of the month, you just add the numbers and that will give you the ventilator days. So surveillance staff should record the number of patients in the surveillance unit who have or who are on ventilator. Patient day is the total number of patients who are physically present in the surveillance unit and the patient day should be collected at the same time as the ventilator day. Now, how do you analyze the data? The most important, the globally accepted uh, uh, trait, uh, how, to, how actually you define or how you publish or how you project your rate is the ventilator associated pneumonia rate. So the VAP rate is the number of VAP episodes per thousand ventilator days. Okay, so you divide the number of VAPs by the number of ventilator day and multiply by 1000. So VAP rate is number of ventilator associated pneumonias divided by number of ventilator days into 1000. And the second criteria is device utilization ratio. So like for BSI and UTI, the presence of device is the risk factor for device associated infection. Okay, so we just want to know that how many patient days were actually device days. Okay, so device utilization ratio is a very simple parameter where you can at a glance understand that whether an ICU is having a very high utilization ratio of ventilators, central lines or even any catheters. That means a large number of patients are actually on a particular device, right? So the ventilator utilization ratio is calculated by dividing the number of ventilator days by patient days. And it is always a ratio, so it has to be less than one. You can multiply it by 100 to get how many patient days were actually also ventilator days. And that gives you an idea that, okay, if the ventilator, ventilator ratio is uh, 0.9, that means that ICU has uh, a huge uh, utilization ratio of ventilators. That means uh, most of the patient days are also ventilator days and that means there is a very high risk for development of ventilator associated pneumonia. So coming to the case report form for VAP, the first part of the case report form as per BSI and UTI, it requires basic demographic information about the patient. The second part of the case report form has been developed exactly as per the case definition. So you have to write the date of event and I have told you how to find the date of event. Then you have to fill whether the patient was on mechanical ventilation at any time on the date of event or the day before the date of event. So it is a yes, no kind of database. If yes, was the ventilator in place for more than two calendar days? So again, you just have to write yes or no to all these answers. 
Then the second part, the third part is the X-ray finding. Did the patient have a new and persistent or progressive and persistent infiltrate consolidation or cavitation? So it is again yes or no and with date. The B point one is whether the patient had one of the following that is fever, leukocytosis or leukopenia and for elderly is altered mental status. Yes or no and with date. If it is a yes, what was the date? And the B point two is the characters that we just discussed. Onset of new uh, purulent uh, sputum, change in character of sputum, increased respiratory section, uh, suctioning requirement, increased respiratory sex, uh, secretions, new onset or worsening cough, dyspnea, tachypnea, and worsening gas exchange. So again, yes or no, along with date. And the C part is the lab findings that we just discussed, whether it was a culture positive, microscopy positive, um, uh, atypical organisms or in immunocompromised patient, a matching candida from blood and respiratory sample. So these are all just from the definition, a yes or no along with the date. The next part of the case report form asks you for the short term outcome, that is the 14 day patient outcome, whether the patient is still in the ICU, transferred, discharged, left or died. And then the long term outcome, again the same parameter. And the final part of the case report form asks you about the organisms which have been isolated from culture uh, and their antibiotic sensitivity. So it is just a drop down menu in our database. You just have to select the organism and its antibiotic sensitivity. So again, you have a number of choices to add on organism. As I said, within a 14 day time frame, if you find another organism, you just have to add on to that. So this is the device uh, denominator data collection form. So if you are actually doing all the three modules, you can use the same denominator in the ICU. So this is the column for number of patients. Each bed, just write the numbers on each day. So this is 31, all the dates, number of patients on central line, police catheter and ventilator. And at the end of the month, you just add here and this will give you the total number of patient days, central line days, urinary catheter days and ventilator days. So how do you collect denominator data? I have already mentioned that denominator data should be collected at the same time every day, even on weekends or holidays. It should reflect only the patients who are present in the surveillance unit. Data collection can be done by staff, the surveillance staff or clinical staff. So, so on-floor staff can also do that provided it is done at the same time every day. Each ICU should have its own denominator data. So if it's a medical ICU, it should have a separate denominator, a surgical ICU, a separate denominator. So denominator counts are recorded in the form for each day. The daily counts are added up at the end of each month and the form is given to the central surveillance coordinator. And at the end of each month, it is to be submitted and with each month, you are add a new case report form. So this is all about the WAP module. Uh, if you have any queries, I can take them before I hand over to Dan. And then you are a database person who has developed our databases. You will be given a hands-on demonstration of how the database works and how the data flows in our network. So um, I'll be happy to take a few questions. So there is a question if a patient is having FiO2 40 on third ventilator day and 50 on fourth and thereafter 100, do we need to repeat the report the case as there is no stability of FiO2 on two previous days? So as you would know, if you have, if some of you have read the ventilator associated events definition, the respiratory requirements have to be monitored every hour, okay? So unless there is a consecutive uh, uh, deranged uh, entry of the uh, FiO2, you, you cannot take that as a parameter, okay? So your question is right that if there is no stability, you cannot take that. And that is why we have given a number of choices to you. 
and that is why we say that VAE or IVAC is very difficult in our situation because you need continuous monitoring of these respiratory parameters, which becomes very difficult uh, in an ICU, which, which we all know we are facing shortage of staff. So one staff who just keeps on monitoring these PEEP and FIO2 and then two consecutive reading uh, in consecutive hour is very difficult. So your question is right, we cannot take that because there is no consistency. Um, one of the question is what is the purpose of window period? I am again and again telling that when you need a window period because to define any case, uh, say if you're talking about typhoid, right? Um, or for any infection, say tuberculosis, there is a definite set of criteria, say meningitis or sinusitis. There is A, B, C, D. These are the defining criteria, okay? Now, these defining criteria have to happen within a set time frame. We cannot say that it's a case of urinary tract infection because the patient had fever today and 30 days after that he had a culture positive or he had a dysuria after 15 days. So, all the parameters or the criteria that we have for defining a particular infection must occur within our set time frame. Because here we are talking about surveillance. We are not talking about individual diagnosis of one patient where the clinicians really rack their brains to diagnose a particular infection because they have to treat that particular case. Here you have to do a case analysis to understand the trend and that is why you have to define a case in a particular time frame. And the window period is a period where all during those seven days, all the defining criteria must be met. Only then you can say, okay, this fits the case definition, okay? It cannot be that one criteria occurs today, the other criteria occurs after 10 days. So window period is very important because everything that defines a particular infection must happen within that seven days, okay? And again, it is needed because out of that, whatever happened first becomes your date of event. So I think that should be very clear by now why we need the window period. So microbiological criteria, you want uh, one more clarification, you will be getting these slides which will be uploaded. It is just one of these criteria, okay? So it is either a positive culture, which is 10 to the power 5, quantitative or semi-quantitative, either from bal, endotracheal aspirate or sputum, or a culture positive pleural fluid, or more than 5% bal cells contain intracellular bacteria on microscopy. It can also be a definitive diagnosis of fungal infection through histopath or cultures or some atypical organisms that you've identified through molecular or serological tests. And only for immunocompromised patients, you can take candida if there is a matching culture from blood and respiratory samples. Otherwise, you have to ignore candida species, spawns, and enterococci. One of you is asking, it is called VAE and not VAP. I have, I started my lecture with that. Probably you missed that. It is very difficult to do VAE because you need continuous monitoring and it's very, very difficult in the Indian setup. You can do VAE if you have the staffing, if you have the resources, you can do that. But at a network level, we, it's very difficult to do VAE. We have done a multi-centric study in which we found that Doing VAE is really not sustainable and that is why probably you missed out the initial part. Uh, one of the question is what might be the justification of pleural fluid? Pleural fluid is very justified because it is the only sterile fluid. Uh, we say that a, a brush specimen of, um, you know, bronchoscopy is also a very good sample because it collects uh, the cells of the alveoli through the brush. Otherwise, even a bile sample can be... Um, can get contaminated through upper respiratory flora while you are taking out the bronchoscope. So that is why if you get something from pleural fluid, it's like a lung aspirate. It's a very, very sterile fluid and that is why it is taken as uh, a criteria for that. Uh, one of the question is, is there any defined time interval for the serial x-ray to know persistent x-ray findings as different patients? And, and that is, yeah, you are very right. So persistent means, uh, so it ha ideally it should be a progressive X-ray finding or a persistent consolidation. So sometimes in trauma patient, there is atelectasis, you know, one day you find that the lung is collapsed and the other day it's so absolutely okay. 
So there is no time frame, and that's why um, I'm again and again emphasizing that for X-ray, you really need to have inputs from the intensivist or the radiologist. Um, Dr. Renu Gupta is saying we have been doing VA surveillance at IBA since two years according to CDC criteria. As part of AIMS, would you uh, want to start VAP? Uh, so if you want to uh, do VAP according to our network, you have to do it additionally, but it's optional. If you are doing VAE and you are okay, and uh, you you can keep on doing that uh, the VAE because it is okay for institutions. Uh, many hospitals are who are well resourced uh, are doing VAE surveillance. But if it is like for BSI and UTI, uh, we always say that for this network we need these definitions. So there are many hospitals which may be using a separate definitions for UTI. Supposing you are not doing candida in your normal surveillance, but we want that for our surveillance network, you stick to the protocol that we are proposing. It's because only when we are all doing the same, we have a data which is represented. Um, in case of bad, why is it necessary to give coronary so one of the question is that in case of bell, why is it necessary to give colony count? That for that, uh, you can uh, read uh, the review articles on diagnosis of VAP. Okay, you have excellent review articles on diagnostics for VAP, and there has been ample discussion uh, in the scientific world. You need a quantitative or semi-quantitative cultures from respiratory sample now. The most unideal sample is sputum sample, where you definitely need the PAR-5 and uh, also uh, the quality of sputum that the first cells to epithelial cells ratio. Everything is important because it is contaminated uh, by upper respiratory pleura. When you go do lower down a tracheal aspirate, it is again contaminated with upper respiratory pleura because you are doing it. If you are doing it through tracheostomy, that tracheostomy site is very often colonized with upper respiratory pleura. Now, even for bronchoalveolar levage, you need a quantitative culture because when you are taking out the bronchoscope, there is a very high chance that it may be contaminated with upper respiratory pleura. So, respiratory tract per se is not a sterile site, right? For a patient who is on ventilator, there is a very high chance that the patient keeps on micro aspirating, you know, so the upper respiratory pleura does go down. And that is why a quantitative culture is recommended for bronchoalveolar levage. Now, what is the cutoff is up to you. Some people say it should be 10 to the power 5 for BAL. And some review says it should be 10 to the power 4 for BAL and 10 to the power 5 for tracheal aspirate. But definitely we need a cutoff for bronchoalveolar levage also. Uh, the cutoff is something you can decide. Is one question, what about VAP surveillance with patient already presenting with pneumonia? So, uh, VAP surveillance on patient already presenting with pneumonia, I really don't understand uh, the exact context in which you are asking. So, already existing pneumonia and the patient has developed, uh, is ventilated and then develops VAP and that is why that is the problem with defining a VAP and that is why the X-ray finding of a progressive or new infiltrate. So your question is very valid that a patient has probably, I, probably you meant that the patient had a community acquired pneumonia and he was intubated and then how do you call VAP? I agree that it is very difficult and that is where the X-ray findings have to be really, really collaborated or corroborated by the intensivist or the radiologist because as I said, it is either a new or progressive infiltrate. So on a, in a patient who has pneumonia, if you find new or progressive infiltrate, then you have a positive culture, then you have worsening of gas uh, exchange parameters, worsening. So everything is a progressive thing, right? If a patient has pneumonia and you find new onset, only then you can say that it's a new episode or it's an episode of VAP. And that is where continuous monitoring is needed. And you need A plus B1 plus B2 plus C. So all these criteria have to be there to call it as ventilator associated pneumonia. Last question. Why cause enterococcus and candida species to be excluded in 
Okay, so one more question is why cons candida enterococcus are to be excluded because they are all upper respiratory pollen analysis. You will not see coagulis negative staph causing ventilator associated pneumonia or enterococcus or candida species. They are well known upper respiratory pollen analysis and that is why they have to be excluded. So that finishes the VAC module and now I invite uh, Dr. Daniel van der Ende, who is from the CDC country office. We'll be talking about uh, a protocol for surveillance of surgical site infection, which is again India specific. And it has been developed after um, a lot of discussion uh, with the Ministry of Health, the Maternal and Child Division, uh, the Lakshya program, uh, because we thought that Surgical site infection is something that we were missing out in our country uh, and it's a very important uh, infection acquired in the hospital. As you would have seen that the CDC's NHSN definition for surgical site infection require is, is uh, very clearly defined. These infections are mostly acquired when the patient leaves the hospital. So as as opposed to the infection that we have discussed since yesterday, which is blood stream infection, UTI and VAP, uh, you stop the surveillance once the patient goes out of the ICU, right? Because the risk of acquiring infection is the presence of device and the patient is housed there. Surgical site infection is an exception because most of the surgical site infections develop when the patient reaches home, okay? Because, because of the policy of early discharges now, uh, and that is where the problem lies that to coin a patient as having surgical site infection, you need prolonged follow ups, which becomes very difficult because the patient is already out of the healthcare facility. And with that in mind, and the importance of surgical site infection in uh, cesarean sections, we started with a definition. I think I hand over to uh, Dr. Van der Ende now. He will tell the story that we built upon and how we came up with a new protocol for surgical site infections. So over to you, Dan. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Porva, and welcome everyone. I think it's fantastic.